cross my heart, hope to die. A very common saying that we learned as children. I'm not going to follow it with the stick of needle in my eye part because, my goodness, are you crazy? I mean, you know, I can make a promise without having to inflict pain on myself. Maybe in, in the past, uh, especially in the Indian culture, whenever they would uh, walk up to one another and meet people of another tribe, and they would say, we would say, they say, how? And I know many of you have American, a Native American heritage in here. We have a, a reservation within a few miles of here. Uh, typically, the tradition goes that they would meet somebody and they would put their hand up, maybe say how, maybe not. But by showing their hand, they would show how many scars they had in their hand. Because the number of scars in their hand showed how many vows and allies that they had. And so by looking at somebody's hand, you could see if they had a lot of friends or not. And so maybe there is something of making a vow, shedding a little blood. There's a little bit of pain behind a promise. But I ain't going to stick a needle in my eye when I promise to anybody. You're not going to stick a needle in my arm. The nurse has got to chase me around the hospital. Can I get an amen? It's just how I roll. Cross my heart, hope to die. Uh, we'll be doing this for the next several weeks. That's the name of my series. Today's message in particular is called, Death is a Part of Life. How many of you know that death is a part of life? It is. That's, that's a true statement. Uh, now, I don't ever want to deem uh, be getting political necessarily in uh, the, the pulpit, but I want to tell you something I came across. It was obviously somebody that is not pro-Bama. Uh, they were a critic of our president and, and saying something about his administration. I pray for my president every day. Because I, I cannot judge him from where I sit. I'm not his boss, number one. I don't know the weight that he sits under. And I pray that he prays. That he hears from God. But this critic said, that in, a, in a few situations about our president's administration, this critic said, when it comes to Benghazi, the president says, death is a part of life. When it comes to abortion, the president says, it's a choice. When it comes to gun control, the president says, if we can just save one life at a time. You know, and so maybe that you, however that affects you, I thought it was an interesting read because death is a part of life and it's really in God's control. I know tragedies happen, accidents happen, murders happen. If you watch the news, murders happen. War is going on around this world. Some death happens expectedly. Uh, who's ever been in a hospital room when a loved one passed on? Several of us. A ton of hands going up. We know death is a part of life. Who's ever been around uh, a tragic accident where somebody died accidentally? I've been there. I've been in the room where somebody, a young man in his 40s, had a heart attack and died right there in front of me. And my dad and I were doing the CPR. I've been there. I'll never forget that. It reminds me death is a part of life. I wish death wasn't a part of my life, but it's in the Bible. We're going to read that in just a minute. I, when I was a nine-year-old boy, I, had, uh, I spent my last few moments with uh, my, the only great-grandfather that I ever knew. My dad's grandfather on his side uh, had passed away before I was ever born. And, but my great-grandfather on my mom's side, her grandfather was uh, Grady Eisen. He owned a vineyard. He had no teeth, and he didn't even wear false teeth. You know, the only face I ever knew was... You know, that's the, that's the only face I ever knew. But the man could gum some ice cream sandwiches to death. And so whenever I'd go to Grand, Grandpa Grady's house, we would tear up some ice cream sandwiches. Amen? I mean, tear them up. I have memories of us sitting on the porch talking about everything from, from family to Jesus to, to sinners. I mean, he just, you know, I was, I was apparently one of his favorite because I loved him too. And we just sit there and he would talk about everything. I can't remember half of it, but it was, I would die laughing. Ice cream running down my face just, and down his too, you know, so. Uh, but just good old stuff. I was nine, he was 89. So you just think about the, the disparity in age there. And we were just loving it. Uh, I love that time, and I can remember going fishing at his house and just him teaching me some different things like that. Uh, and, and Grandpa Grady began to become disillusioned, and he began to get dementia, and, and to where he, uh, he had the full tilt hospital bed in his, uh, in his home for years uh, because he was beginning to lose his mind, but they still let him get out on the porch, and for some reason, we connected. My nine-year-old mentality and his uh, <laughs> craziness, we just connected, and I brought him back to, to uh, coherency for a minute, I guess, and, and he had lost his mind, had forgotten everybody, and I remember coming from football practice as a nine-year-old boy, walked into the hospital room, 
And he didn't know anybody, didn't even know his wife. And he looked right at me, Keith, come here, dude. It was the craziest thing. I was like, yeah, that's right, you know. <laughs> so I'm walking, I mean, and we're just hanging out. He's like, hey, they won't give me any ice cream in here. You got anything? I mean, just, he's always conniving. And, and I can remember sitting around talking, and, and he didn't know my dad. He didn't know my mom. He didn't know his wife. And he's sitting there talking to me. You know this guy? You know, I was like, yeah, and I was telling him who everybody is. And he looked at my dad. He said, I hear you're a preacher. My dad said, yeah. He said, you see Jesus up there in the corner? My dad looked up. And Jesus wasn't in the corner. But, you know, you want to entertain. And maybe you've been in places where somebody was seeing stuff. It happens. You see Jesus in the corner? And my dad said, yeah. No, you ain't. You're lying. He ain't up there. <laughs> that, was, that was just my grandpa. That was my great grandpa. He was just hilarious. Can't trust nobody, can we, Keith? It was just it was the funniest thing. I just... You know, and until, and, and, and for several weeks, he was just there, he was slipping, he was slipping, but he would always remember me when I'd walk in, it was the craziest thing, he would remember me, and, and I remember he finally passed away, and, and I mean, just the sadness, in, at an early age, you learn that death is a part of life, you know, we've seen those kind of things, I remember in my mom's last days on earth, for the last 10, 10 days or so, she was completely unresponsive, and just gasping for a breath, one or two breaths a minute, it got just, and then nothing, and then as her body would just slowly say goodbye. But before she got to that point, I remember her saying to her sisters who were like, oh, Lord, what are we going to do? You know, just, just in a tizzy. And she says, hey, y'all can weep and cry, whatever, but I'm going to lay here in the valley of the shadow of death and go to sleep. That was just my mom. She knew death was a part of life. She never said, why me, when it came to cancer? She said, why not me? Why not? If somebody's got to be sick, why not me? I have faith. And she did have that faith. And she fought cancer for 10 years until her body had no energy left. And she was ready to go home and be with her maker. In Hebrews chapter 9, just a very common verse that we know. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 and 28. I'm reading from the New American Standard. And it says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Who's eagerly awaiting his second appearance? Amen? He's appeared to me. I remember as a child accepting Jesus into my heart. And I remember as I was praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit before I spoke in tongues, that I could feel the presence of Jesus drawing me into prayer and drawing me to his presence. I can remember specifically uh, my first word in tongues, that Jesus was there with me, baptizing me into the Holy Spirit. The, this word, in as much, is out of the New American Standard. And it means uh, all the way through. Completely. It means 100%. In as much. It's like somebody saying, guarantee with my seal, with my sign. It is guaranteed that man will die once. Guaranteed. Can I get an amen? Or an oh me. If you're ready, it's an amen. If you're not, yet, whoa, hold on. I guarantee that it is appointed that man has been set apart, ready you have been made an appointment. A reservation has been made with death for you by God. It's a guarantee you're going to die once. It's going to happen. Just like Jesus died once. You are going to die once. That death or to die is a natural or a violent death as a tree dies up or a seed rots that is never planted. The judgment is a separation. It is a trial, a test. In that judgment, you're going to stand alone. Again, can I get an amen? amen? Everything that you've ever done. <laughs> in Revelations, it mentions that those that die in the Lord, your deeds will follow after you. The deeds of life, the deeds that you perform to carry out, your deeds, your trials and tests or testimonies on this earth are going to follow after you. They're a part of you. I got a few things I want to share with you this morning in light of my memories of my great-grandfather and of my mother and of what scripture has led me to this morning based on that foundational verse. Number one, we all have to die. Scripture says it. It is in black and white and sometimes in red. If your Bible has the red words of Jesus. That carrying a cross, that laying down your life is a part of following Jesus. We all have to die. Everybody say that. We all have to die. That's a part of life. Look around this room. Right now we're all alive. But everybody in this room is the Lord tarries. We're going to die. That's a fact of life. Some of us earlier than others, some of us later than others. I'm by no means wanting to stray into being morbid, 
Maybe you've seen it in a movie. Maybe you've watched a movie in the, in the midst of a, an anxious or tragic moment. Somebody running around, we're going to die. <laughs> there are people that live that way. I'm not going to endorse this movie by any means. I saw it as a teenager uh, about the, the large boat. They said, not even God can sink this ship. Well, we find out that an iceberg could sink that ship, the Titanic. And, and in the midst of the chaotic sinking portion of that movie, people are screaming, running all over the place, ah, going crazy, fighting one another. There is chaos. We're going to die. Yeah, you're going to die. That's a fact of life. But you shouldn't be caught up in that kind of mindset. You don't have to be fearful of death. It's a part of life. Death is a part of life. There's the other side of the coin in that movie. There's also, and this drove me crazy. In the midst of the sinking ship and the people trying to get to the lifeboats and fighting and, and other people not being able to swim, dropping in the frozen water, there's these three or four guys sitting on the deck with their violins and cellos. And then they get up, enjoy the gentlemen. They walk a little bit and then they start playing again. Maybe you've seen that. I don't think that's the right way to look at death either, to ignore it. I think somewhere in between, we're going to die, and and I don't care. Somewhere in between that is where God wants you to be. Because after he had told all his uh, followers, hey, following me means death. And I'm going to show you the way. I'm going to die first. He says, now go teach other people how to die. Because the same word for martyr is servant, is disciple. The same root word. And so we're signing up for this as a follower of Jesus Christ. And he told his disciples that. Now make sure you teach other people how to do that. He doesn't want you to be the oblivious cellist in the middle of the chaos. He doesn't want you to be the guy running around screaming, lost, losing his mind. But he wants you to be the guy with the whistle teaching other people how to get on the boat. Hey, here's the way to life. Attention, please. Here's the way to life. Not the guy sitting quietly in the boat, not telling anybody, but the guy out there trying to get other people in the boat. And I think maybe that's what the church needs to be. We need to be the guy saying, hey, we're all dying, but there is a way to life. I think the church should be the lifeboat, don't you? I think the church should be the lifeboat, and every single one of us should be standing on the deck of the sinking planet saying, hey, here's the boat. Get in the boat. Hey, what do I have to do to get your attention? Smack. Get in the boat. I think Alan Griffin would have done that. He'd have smacked somebody. But Alan has a little smack in him, doesn't he? We are the lifeboat, and we got to get everybody into the lifeboat that we can. There are people in this world living life lost in a panic. What are we going to do? Oh, no, the stock market. Oh, no, my finances. Oh, no, I'm sick. Ah, I'm going to die. Yes. You're going to die since you've been born. You start dying the moment you're born. I mean, it's crazy. It sounds morbid, but it's scriptural. We're all going to die, and death is a part of life. Now, he doesn't want you to be way over here lofty and stuck in your lifestyle. Oh, no, death is beneath me, whatever. But somewhere in the middle of it, thank you for that laughter, I appreciate it. It was meant to be funny. Somewhere in the midst of that, God wants you to be blowing the whistle saying, hey, I know where the boat is. It's right here. He wants you to be saving, reaching out, delivering people from chaos, from fear. Amen? That's how Jesus would want us because he never asked us to do anything that he didn't do first. He said, we got to die. And here's how you do it. That's what he said. He said, death is a part of life. Jesus was only on the face of the earth for 33 years. And he died. But he knew he was going to die. He didn't want to die, but he was willing to die. Galatians 2.20, Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Death is a part of life. But once you accept that death, then you're free to live. Amen? Once you accept the fact that death is a part of life, you don't have to live in fear. I'm not looking forward to dying. I like to think that I've already laid down my life. I'm not looking forward to it, but I'm not afraid of it because I know that death is a doorway. Death is the beginning of eternity. It's not the end of anything. We're all going to die. Secondly, we only die once. I wanted to stress this to make sure you understood this. We only die once. That is the appointment. That is the reservation that God made with every single one from Adam to the last person that's born in eternity. 
while, while humans are being born and whether or not they're going to be born in all of eternity, that's your interpret of, interpretation of Scripture whether or not that happens. But while we're on the face of the earth, every person that's born is going to die once. And that reservation and appointment has been made. Paul says literally that I die daily. I die daily, meaning that every day I choose death so that it's not an option for me. And I'm going to explain all this in just a minute where I'm going. But the same Greek word that meant it in as much in our very first verse is the same word for daily. It's a guarantee. Paul's saying I die daily, meaning that I have died all the way through and I have not held anything back completely, 100%. I choose death. That's what Paul's saying. John 3.16 says that based on our belief in Christ, that he is the son of God, it means that we will not perish. But it doesn't say we won't die, does it? It just says we won't perish. Two completely different words. Perish means waste away, to be lost and forgotten. Belief doesn't mean you won't die. It just means you won't perish. That's good. That's a good place to say amen. John chapter 6, 47 through 50, Jesus says this, truly, truly. Anytime he says truly or verily, he's saying, uh-huh, listen up. This is important. He says, truly, truly, I say, he who believes has eternal life. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat it and not die. This is, the, I'm going to read that part again. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat it and not die. Is Jesus saying that we're not going to die? He said the words we're not going to die. But it continues in verse 51. He says, I am the living bread. That came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of, of, of uh, the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue, saying, "How can this man give us his flesh to eat?" So Jesus said to them, "Truly, truly, I say, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life." And I will raise him up on that last day. He finishes with, and I will raise him up, meaning that death was a part of that equation. But he's not talking about not dying. He's talking about not perishing and all of that. So nowhere in Scripture does anyone say that you won't have to die. I want you to get that, that you will have to die, and death is a part of life. Now, what about if the rapture happens while we're still alive? Well, you still have to die. And I'll explain how this works. When Paul says, I die daily, he says the same exact word, die, as the writer of Hebrews, which we believe is Paul, said that everyone will have to die once. And that I believe, point number three, that we choose when we die. That you choose when you want to die. And if I choose to die before this body dies, then that is my death. If I choose to die to my carnal lust and, and fleshly desires, if I choose to lay down greed and perversion and the thoughts that this body wants to do and focus on, then I choose to die in that moment. And though my body may or may not physically die, I have died, just like Paul said, that my old man died on the cross with Christ. That if you choose death now, then you won't have to worry about death later and you don't have to live in fear. I love how people that are saints in, in the kingdom of God lying on their deathbed and people around them panicking and worried and they have the peace of God. My mother had the peace of God because she had died a long time ago to this world. She had given up the things of this world, didn't care about what she was or was not going to take with her. She had already died. Can I get an amen? She had laid it down. My mom died, and my sister and I, as well as my dad and my wife and her husband, not my wife's husband, my sister's husband, good night, <laughs> got to explain these things, my wife and her other, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> we'll edit that off the video, we had to go through her stuff, we had to go through my mama's stuff, there was video cameras that were 10 and 12 years old still in the packaging that had never been opened. So much, so many clothes still with the price tags on them that we, we had no idea that were in her closets. All kind of, like I found hundreds of golf balls and, and, and logo things that my dad had collected through years and years of golf. Uh, luggage, Tommy, like 30 suitcases, shelves of just stuff. 
bins of just stuff. How much of it did she take with her when she died? Nothing. Nothing. You better think about what you're living for, folks. Because when you die, none of it goes with you. All this stuff that you go crazy to save up and store up and collect and to have and that we're proud of on the face of this earth. Even the car you're driving, it ain't going to get you into heaven. And I love cars. I want a nice car. I'm like, come on, Lord. You know? You're not going to take it with you. The car we drive was my mom's car. Our SUV. My mom owned it for a few months. And we found out later she bought it for us. But she didn't take it with her. And she's the one that spent however much money was on that tag. And she didn't take anything with her. But she wasn't worried about any of that stuff as she was breathing her last breath. She was ready to meet Jesus because she had died already to that stuff. You choose. You choose when you die. And you can die to the things of this world right now. Or you can worry about it and die later in agony. Ah! Think about that. We choose when we die. Amen? Let me encourage you with a little scripture there. Matthew 16 says it this way. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life or soul for my sake will find it. What profited a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Not a bit. You know that there was somebody, a supernatural being in scripture, that did look into the face of humanity and tell them they would not die? In Genesis chapter 3, the serpent looked at Eve and said, Oh, no, no, no. You won't die. Well, that tells you right there that it's a lie, doesn't it? Jesus never said we won't die. He said we won't perish. He said, in fact, Jesus said you need to carry that cross daily. And guess what that word daily means? The same way that Paul used daily, the same way that in as much means guaranteed through and through. Jesus said you better die daily and deny yourself if you're going to follow me. He's saying, because death is coming, and you can die now so that your death is painless, or you can die later, and it's going to scare you to to death. Think about it, church. We're all going to die, but you only got to die once, and you get to choose when you die. And the last point that I want to leave with you this morning is you cannot lose what you have given away. You cannot lose what you have already given away. Amen? So when my mom was facing death... And nobody that close to me has died before. My mom was facing death and there was no fear. I mean, she was hurting. She could hardly even smile because the cancer was eating her from the inside out. She was in so much pain, but there was still a peace. I remember those last few moments we got to spend with her. She couldn't even leave the house. She could barely get out of bed just to get in a warm bath and get back in bed. It was a terrible way for her to spend her last few moments, but we got all the family in there. We're spending time with her, talking with her, loving on her. I've told you the story about how she got to see Layla. As they just kind of were two ships passing in the night as my mom was on her way out. Layla was just a few days old. They had that interaction. Um, We have the picture of that. Great memories. My mom had already given her life away. She had already laid it down. She wasn't worried about passing into eternity because death had already happened for her. That's why Paul says, I die daily. That's why in Luke, Jesus said, you have to carry your cross daily. It means that you have to die through and through. You die through and through now as a follower for me, so that when death does come and sickness does come, you're not worried about dying because you've already given everything up. Amen? And nothing that you give away can be taken from you. You cannot lose what you've already given away. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life For his friends. No one can take away. What I have given away. You know you only have to die once. And if if you're willing to lay down your life. I mean. Paul goes into. And you know. Let me give you this. Let me give you. Let me take you here real quick. uh, Colossians 3. I want to take just so you know. What death looks like. Smells like. Tastes like. What death to this body. To this flesh. Colossians Colossians 3, beginning in 1, verse 1. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keeping the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, 
then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self and its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Those things, if those things are still a part of your life and maybe you don't have them on the sign outside your door, you know, we got welcome all or, or welcome mats or uh, my, my mom always had the painting by the door. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what you put on your walls. But what's going on in your heart? What do you live for? What, what do you feel pressure when, when things are squeezed in your life? Your things, your stuff, your finances. What do you struggle with? Are, is there still greed? Is there still lust, perversion? Uh, do you still have a problem with authority? All those things mean that you haven't died. And Paul said it wasn't easy. He said I had to do it daily. And you may have to die daily. You may have to get up and remind yourself, I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus today. And I don't think that it was easy at first. I think that choosing death spiritually and laying down your life, it's as painful as physical death at times because you're choosing to put everything that you desire on the back burner and say, God, whatever you have for me is what I want to live for now. That I have died and now Christ lives through me. I want people not to have, not to see me when they look at Pastor Keith, but they see the presence of the Lord. And not for my gain. I don't want to be anointed so that people can say, Woo, Pastor, you can preach. Man, I just want to be a hand of the Lord. If it means washing feet, cleaning toilets, I don't care. I'm going to do it in Jesus' name because I've done it all. My first job in the church was a maintenance man. I've done it all and I ain't afraid of dirt. Colossians 2.20 says that you have died with Christ and he has set you free from spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world? Christ has set you free. Church, you don't have to live or worry about these things. Choose to die to those things. 